Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. God is good, and all the time. Good evening, everyone. How are you? It is very nice to see you. It always is. And I direct those words also to those watching us via Facebook and YouTube, wherever you are. We're grateful for your presence and your continuing interest in the words of life. And may the Lord richly reward you with the revelation of his will for your life as you listen to the words tonight. Is there anyone present who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? You are a visitor. May I see your hand? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. You are a visitor. May I see your hand? All right. As always, I am sure there are those watching who are not Seventh-day Adventists. Thank you for joining with us. Let me say it again. Thank you for joining with us. And may God touch you personally with his hand of mercy, his hand of healing, and his hand of resources. Thank you very much. And may he place a double blessing on your children, wherever you are. We also ask God to bless all the nations represented by those who are listening. It is not easy to be a leader, whether of a church, a family, or a nation. And so we ask God to guide the minds of those leaders that their decisions may be favorable to the cause of the gospel. I had a good day, and I thank God for that. This is the last day of the second week. From tomorrow, we enter into the third week, and before you can blink twice, it will be all over. Time really flies very quickly. That's why if you have something to do, do it, because time will not wait for you. If there's someone you need to forgive, forgive the person before you or the person dies. If there's someone to whom you need to apologize, do that while there is time. When Jesus realized that Judas would betray him, you know what he told Judas? That thou doest, do quickly. You've got to do something, get on with it, because time flies very quickly. I'm grateful to God for life and for health and for this high, high honor of speaking for him. It is just about one minute after seven. I'll try my very best, and I will succeed, I believe, in releasing you before eight o'clock, as I just have tried to do on almost, almost every occasion. Our subject for this evening is, don't put God on hold. What did I say? Don't put God on hold. Favor number one, make sure these are turned off so that they do not ring while we're worshiping the holy God of heaven and earth. And again, you have been very good in this department. Thank you for your cooperation and for the reverence that you've shown to God. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Consider that. The Lord puts forth his hand and touches your mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And those are the words I seriously desire to speak tonight. Favor number three, think. Isaiah 118, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Think. You've listened to two weeks of messages. Think. What have you done? What decisions have you made? What has been your responses to the words of life and the words of truth you have heard? Think. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you as your children we come seeking a blessing. We come seeking light and guidance that we may live lives that please you and that are a blessing to others. Father, we ask you quickly, if there's anything in us unlike you, forgive us. Cleanse us of that thing, dear God, 
that nothing may lie between us and our Savior. Dear God, I humble myself before you in the dust. I ask you to use me, Father. It is a privilege I can never deserve, but I thank you for it, Father. And as you strengthen me, I will do everything in my power to represent the truth aright by the words I speak. For it is truth alone that sanctifies and sets people free. Father, bless all those listening. A special blessing on all our guests who are not Adventists, but have taken the time to be with us. Bless the nations represented, God. Guide the deliberations of the leaders, that the decisions may please you and be advantageous to your work. Father, if anyone listening has contracted the COVID-19 virus, in the name of Jesus, the great physician, Father, I ask you, heal that person. Father, I repeat my words. I ask you, in the name of Jesus, who healed everyone who came to him, heal that person, Father. And for the rest of those listening, protect them from that virus. Now, dear God, we commit this service to your glory. Take charge, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis 12, reading from verse 1. Our subject, don't put God on hold. Genesis 12, and I've identified the verses we're about to read as about just about the most important passage or some of the most important verses in the entire Bible. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Do you have that? And I read from the King James Version of the Bible. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Question, why did God call Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees? Get thee out of thy country. That's, let's maybe Kenya or Tanzania or Sweden or Japan, United States. Leave your country and from thy kindred, your extended family, uncles, aunts, cousins, in-laws, and from thy father's house, your immediate family. What was God calling Abraham from? Because he calls you from one thing to something else. Go to Joshua 24. Let us see what God called Abraham from. Our subject, do not put God on hold. Joshua 24, reading from verse 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for the officers and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, Notice how the verse ends. And they served other gods. Abraham's relatives practiced idol worship. Now let me say quickly, they also incorporated much of the true religion, but they mixed the true with the false. That makes the entire thing unacceptable. The Bible says, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood. The flood there refers to the Euphrates River. Abraham had to come from one side of the river, cross to come into Canaan. Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, from that environment of idol worship. I took your father Abraham from that environment of unacceptable worship based on man-made commandments. I took your father Abraham from an environment of worship that displeased me and led him throughout all the land of Canaan 
and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. Why did God call Abraham? He called him from false worship. And God wanted to establish through Abraham a people who would reflect in their lives godly worship. Worship based on God's requirements, not on false gods, but on the true God. And so I repeat, God called Abraham out of a system of false worship, but it was worship. But not for God. Let me repeat. The place where Abraham was born, Ur of the Chaldees. When you hear Chaldees, think of Babylon. They had their religion. They were not a religionless people. They had their religion, but God did not like it. The word religion does not necessarily create music in the ear of God. The word church does not necessarily put a smile on the face of God. Because a church said, by virtue of the leaders, crucify him. Let me say it a little more calmly. The words church, religion, and worship mean nothing to God unless they are practiced according to his requirements. And so God took Abraham from a system of worship, church, that he might be the head of an obedient people. Let's go to Exodus 19. It's a passage we've read before. We'll read verse 4 and verse 5. 4 to 6. You have Exodus 19, 4 to 6. Let me pray again. Father, I ask again for more power, more clarity of speech, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen. Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. And how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. God called the Israelites out of Egypt. Now why? Let us go to Exodus 4. We read verses 22 and 23. Why did God call Israel out of Egypt? We have established why God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. He called him out of false worship. Why did God call the Israelites out of Egypt? Exodus 4, verses 22 and 23. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may do what? Serve me. To serve is to obey. God said, let my son go that he may serve me. If you read Exodus 7, when God began to send the plagues, plague number one in chapter 7 of Exodus, Moses told Pharaoh, let my people go that they may serve me. Chapter 7, verse 1, it's verse 16. In chapter 8, verse 1, let my people go that they may serve me. In verse 20 of chapter 8, that they may serve me. In chapter 9, verse 1, that they may serve me. Verse 13, that they may serve me. The reason was God wanted the people out of Egypt that they might be an environment where they could obey him or serve him because to serve God is to obey God they could not do that in Egypt where they were controlled they were slaves they had no freedom to do as they desired the situation was so bad for them that Moses had to say to God behold when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them the God of your fathers have sent me unto you and they shall say to me what is his name they had virtually forgotten God this was the condition in an environment steeped in polytheistic worship worshiping many gods idol worship the kind of worship that puts a frown on the face of God and so as God called their father Abraham from an idol-worshipping environment, 
God called the descendants of Abraham from an idle worshiping environment or expressed differently from a system of worship not based on God's requirements. What's our subject? Don't put God on hold. Abraham could have told God, wait a minute. Let me get two more children. Let me get another degree. Let me buy another house. Let me do this, that, or the next before I respond to this call. The Israelites could have said something similar. As a matter of fact, from time to time when hardships hit them, they wanted to go back. But they could have said in Egypt, we're staying. When God calls you, respond to that call. It may be the last call God sends your way. Let us go to Exodus, not Exodus, Acts chapter 7. We'll read 37 and 38. We'll take another look at why God called Israel out of Egypt. Exodus 7, not Exodus, I keep saying Exodus, Acts 7, 37 and 38. Acts chapter 7, 37 and 38. This is that Moses, which was in the church in the world, which was, which said unto the, our fathers, or the children of Israel, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet unto you of yourselves, like unto me, of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. The Lord your God shall raise up unto you, and this was a prophecy about Jesus Christ, because he was a prophet. Of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. Now 38, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Now, how does the Bible or um, Luke refer to the Israelites in the wilderness? As a church. This is he which was in the church in the wilderness with the angel that spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. The Israelites in the wilderness are described by Luke as a church. They were not a church in Egypt. There were people in Egypt, a collection of tribes. They were not a church. Let's go back now to Exodus 19 to see God organizing them into a church. Our subject, don't put God on hold. Exodus 19, we read from verse 4 again and we'll go down to 6. By the way, when I talk about God calling the Israelites, I'm referring to Jesus Christ. An agent of the Father, yes, but the person who appeared to Moses in the burning bush was Jesus Christ. The person, the Bible says, and they drank of that rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The person who shouted from Mount Sinai, and the Bible says his voice shook the whole earth, Hebrews 12, that was Jesus. The one who came with all the fire and thunder with his father, it was Jesus. The God that led the Israelites through the wilderness was Jesus. What we're about to read, we're listening to the voice of... Now, he wasn't called Jesus then, the second member of the Godhead. Listen to the words of your Savior and mine. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians. What did Jesus do to the Egyptians? He sent ten plagues. What else did Jesus do to the Egyptians? He drowned the entire Egyptian army that pursued the Israelites across the Red Sea. God called the Israelites across the Red Sea. He did not call the Egyptians. I have to pause on that. There is a great difference between faith and presumption. When the Israelites crossed the Red Sea on dry land, they crossed in faith because they were called. They obeyed. The Egyptians were not called. That's presumption. And they paid for it. Who called the Israelites across that sea? Jesus Christ. 
Who punished the Egyptian army? Jesus Christ. The Bible says not one soldier escaped. God gives life. He can take it. Let's go back to Exodus 19, 4. He have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. There will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Let's look at holy nation. How were they to become a holy nation? Go to Deuteronomy 28. Let's read verse 9. Deuteronomy 28. When you have time, read Deuteronomy 28. It's a long chapter. The first 14 verses express what God does for those who obey. The rest of the chapter is what happens to those who disobey. Take some time, read it. It applies then, it applies now. Look at verse 9. Let me pray. Father, as we look at this verse, open our eyes, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Lord shall do what? Establish you what? And holy people unto himself. As he hath what? Sworn unto thee, if what? If you have the King James, tell me, if what? If thou do what? Keep his commandments and to walk in his ways. Which establishes a connection between holiness and what? You have to tell me. I'm not proceeding any further. Holiness and obedience. Listen to me carefully now. Remove obedience and holiness goes. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Our subject, don't put God on hold. Some of you listening may be doing that. He may not call again. Abraham did not put him on hold. The Israelites did not put him on hold. 1 Peter 1 verse 22. Towards the back of the Bible, you'll find 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 22. When you find that, say amen. If you have my version, read with me. Seeing ye have done what? Purified your souls. How? In obeying, come on, the truth. What's that key word? Purify. What's the other key word? Obey. Seeing, you see, purification is the work of sanctification. And Peter, under the guidance of the Holy Ghost, he writes, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. My listening friends, wherever you are, when God called the Israelites, he called them to form them into a church. And what he gave them to be the constitution of that church, and I've said this before, was his Ten Commandments. I said earlier, when Abraham was called, Ur of the Chaldees had its religion. God called Abraham from a religion to another one. Ah, uh, you didn't hear what I said. <laughs> you didn't hear me. God called the Israelites from one religion to another one. What's our subject? Don't put God on hold when he calls. And I know he's calling some of you. Go to John chapter 10. John 10. John chapter 10 is 25 after 7. I'll let you out on time. John chapter 10, let's read verse 16. Let's read microscopically. John chapter 10, my second favorite book is John. Beautiful book. What question should you ask me? 
If I say my second favorite book is John, what question should you ask? Uh, Genesis, okay. I like to put in a plug for Genesis. That's where everything starts. John 10, verse 16, if you have my version, read with me. And other sheep I have, which are what? Not of this fold. Which means they are where? In other folds. Them also I must bring. I preached a sermon some time back called On Dangerous Ground. And my point was, biblically, the most dangerous place you can be is in the wrong church. If you read the Bible clearly, carefully, God's most punishing judgments were poured out on religious organizations. God's most bitter punishment in the last days will be poured out on a religious organization called Babylon. God's greatest enemy today, opposing the truth, is a religious organization. And so Jesus says, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, I cannot leave them where they are. They will hear my voice and they will come. God calls through his word. That's his voice. And they shall hear my voice. And they are God's sheep hearing God's voice for the past two weeks. Every night and twice on Sabbath. And they shall be one fold. And one shepherd. When the Bible says, come out of her. Well, let's, before I get to that, let's go back to the Old Testament. Let us go, because I want to stress this concept of calling out. Leviticus 20. Let's read verse 26. Our subject, don't put God on hold. Don't ever do that. The phone of your heart may never ring again. By the way, when the Holy Ghost leaves you, he doesn't come back. That's why God gives us enough time to make the right decision. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm simply telling you when the Holy Ghost leaves you, because of persistent refusal to yield to conviction, he does not come back as a convicting power. Leviticus 20, verse 26. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have severed you from other people. Finish the verse, that ye should be mine. Now, in other words, if you stay where you are, you disqualify yourself as my child. Listen again. I have severed you, cut you off, called you out of that you should be mine. As long as you were over there in error, you were not fully my. I loved you. I shed my blood for you, but you were in the wrong place. I want you with me. God is calling some people to leave one church and join another. Let's go to Deuteronomy 7. We read verse 6. We look at calling out again. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. Book number 5. Deuteronomy 7 Verse 6, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen to be, chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, a special treasure above all people that are upon the face of the earth or all nations. The Lord hath chosen thee. He called you to place you above in his favor everybody else. God never calls you to place you this way. God calls you to place you that way. Can you say amen? God calls you to elevate you. He never calls you to put you down. 
Now, I'm not talking about worldly standards by how much money you have and how many cars you drive. I'm not talking about that. From God's system as measuring value, when he calls you, he calls you to lift you up, never to put you down. The devil calls you to put you down. And so God said, I'm calling you to be special unto me above everyone else on earth. Because some people are closer to God than others. God is calling, I say. He calls people from one to another. When the Israelites came into Canaan, there were all kinds of tribes. You know that. And sometimes they're all called just Canaanites. But there were the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gergesites, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Gergesites, the Hittites, the Hivites. The, you name it, all the ites, as I like to say they all had a religion. They all were religious. God said, avoid them. Avoid them. Because they will corrupt your religion. Avoid them. Be a light to them, but don't let them take you from me. On the border of Israel, on the border of Canaan, the Israelite men went to observe Moabite worship. You know that story? They just went to see and came back with the Moabite women because they practice a sexual form of worship. God had to kill a few thousand of them. My brothers and sisters, God calls you to elevate you because error degrades, truth uplifts. Can you say amen? Let's go now to the book of Galatians. Let's look at the apostle Paul. Galatians, we'll read verse 13. Verse 14, Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1, reading verses 13 and 14. Galatians is a very energetic book. Paul almost sounds angry in Galatians. Chapter 1, verse 13 and four, verse 14. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in what? Come on, tell me in what? The Jews' religion. Paul said, you heard conversation mean lifestyle, behavior, conduct. You have heard of how I behaved when I was part of the Jewish religion. How, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it now. How many churches are in that verse? Come on, how many churches are in that verse? Two. Two. The Jewish religion and the church of God. Paul left one at the call of Christ and came to the other. Are you following me? When he was a member of one religion, he was destroying the members of God's church. Then God called him from that. And then used him to go reach out to them to deliver as many as he could as God had delivered him. God called Paul. The very instant that Paul met Christ on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Let's go to that chapter. Acts 9, we'll read from verse 1, our subject, don't put God on hold. Acts 9 from verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. What did he go for? Letters. So he can arrest the Jews, not the Jews, the Christians. Verse 3, they going towards Damascus. As they journeyed, they came near Damascus. And suddenly they shine round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou? me but wait a minute look at verse one and saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the lord who was saul persecuting the disciples but what did jesus say why persecutest thou me now follow me closely jesus identifies this closely with his followers
Question for you. When Christ knocked Paul off his horse, was Paul a follower of Christ, yes or no? No. Did he become a follower of Christ? Yes. Jesus, I said, identifies very intimately. That's why he, the church, is the body of Christ. Ephesians 5, 30, 31. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. That's the language describing the relation between Adam and Eve. Eve was made from a rib of Adam. She was one with him. The Bible uses that to describe the oneness between Christ and the believer. That oneness does not exist between Christ and an idol worshiper. He has to call us out of that to establish that oneness with us. And so he said, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he said, Lord, verse 6, what wilt thou have me to do? Now he's a child of God like that. He heard the call. He answered in that moment of surrender. And the Lord said, arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. He went from an opposition, an, an, uh, uh, an enemy of Christ, to a follower of Christ. He went from error to truth. He heard the call, and he said yes. But let me stress again. He went from one church to another. Do not put God, finish it for me, on hold. I know in my heart God is calling you to make that move from a system not based on this to a church that elevates